Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Sam, and um, thank you for the Institute for um, inviting me here this, this evening. Um, the, on coming here, I realized for the last time I came to, to this area, it shows you how much um, I don't come here, um, was to a lecture by Milton Friedman um, at the IEA um, in the heyday of the first monetarist revolution, which means late 1970s, and I was a student at that time. And um, it made me think um, that was the heyday of the first monetarist revolution. What went wrong that it's now pretty well passed and we're back to monetary authoritarianism? Um, and a subject of my book is whether there's the possibility of a second monetarist revolution and what it can learn from the failures of the first monetarist revolution. But before I get on to that topic, um, I'm sure when you see the title, The Global Curse of the Federal Reserve, you want to know what, what is the curse? What do I mean by the curse? And I, th I think there's two um, senses of the word, um, two, two, two ideas I have in the book about this. First, at first blush, the, the main curse might seem to be the destruction of purchasing power parity, the fact that the dollar today is only worth four cents of what it was at the time the Federal Reserve opened its doors in 1914. Um, so in, in a real sense, the world's been deprived of what should have been the natural hard money of the globe from which the whole global economy would have gained. Um, but there's a second sense, and that's more one is more uh, preoccupies me more in the book of the the second sense of a curse is the um, waves of irrational exuberance which Federal Reserve policy uh, actions have subjected the world to um, at fairly frequent intervals over that hundred year history and these waves of irrational exuberance or otherwise called asset price inflation um, have uh, created or, or brought in their, in their wake a lot of destruction. I, I write basically about economic destruction but if, in, in fact the destruction can be um, pursued into politics and also geopolitics and in one particular example I come to in, in the 1920s that's very real. So what, what do I mean by the economic destruction that ways of irrational exuberance created by the Fed have left behind? There's two main forms of this economic destruction. One is the so-called malinvestment, which has long been a preoccupation of Austrian school economists, and particularly um, Professor Lachman. Um, and the, 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 what we mean by malinvestment is the, the um, irrational exuberance um, stemming from artificially low interest rates um, sets up a lot of speculative stories which seem as if they are valid and you get investment going into areas which subsequently turn out to be white elephants economically obsolescent. And, and though you can, you can think of shopping malls, um, automobile factories dependent on a lot of consumer credit which cannot be sustained, um, houses in the middle of um, Florida in the 1920s or, or whatever. There's, or, and, and of course this malinvestment extends to human capital too, with people who have, have had trainings in areas which could only be justified by um, passingly popular speculative hypotheses which turned out to be invalid. So all of this leaves behind it economic destruction. But, and that, that, that concept is fairly broadly known. But a new, well, uh, it, it, nothing's new in economics if you, if you go back to von Mises' statement, by the time anyone says something, someone, uh, you can be sure it's, you can find it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I'm not claiming it's new. But a, a, a maybe a semi-new preoccupation in, 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 in the book is um, the second aspect of economic destruction, which is, um, the, the ailing equity risk appetites which are left behind by these waves of irrational exuberance. And um, think, think, think of two societies, one in otherwise similarly endowed, one in which there's a healthy equity risk appetite where people are willing to take equity risk, and another one where there's, a, where there's a, a sick equity risk appetite. Um, 
if everything else is the same, the one, the, the society which has the healthy equity risk appetite, where people are prepared to uh, engage in risky activities and can finance them at a low cost of equity capital, and and there's a there's a reasonably low level of uh, risk because the the monetary framework is 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 known and and um, there's not these huge waves from time to time. That 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 society which has a healthy equity risk appetite is going to become much more prosperous through time. They, they, the, the, the opportunities uh, are, are seized to a greater extent, they're found out to a greater extent, and the voyage into the forest of opportunity is, is pursued more vigorously. Um, so that the, the, um, the waves of, of um, irrational exuberance exert the second form of destruction, which is ailing, ailing equity risk appetites. Now, um, I hope you'll forgive me for going back to a favourite quote of Milton Friedman, um, which he took from J.S. Mill, that um, I'm sure you're all aware of, that um, most of the time the machinery of money is unimportant, um, but when it gets out of control, it becomes a monkey wrench in all the other machinery in the economy. Um, if you were rephrasing that in modern idiom, you would probably say most of the time the software of money is unimportant, but if the software of money becomes corrupted, then it can spread viruses, a virus to all the other software in the economy which controls the vital price signals which um, control the invisible hands of a market economy. And um, when Friedman quoted that line from J.S. Mill, I think it's fairly clear he had in mind goods and services inflation. Um, not asset price inflation. And in my book, as I've mentioned, I'm focused on this other form, second form of virus attack, um, asset price inflation. Um, asset price inflation is not a new term. It goes back, of course, to the Austrian school economists of the early 20th century. But when they talked about asset price inflation, they were mainly thinking about the relative price of capital goods and consumer goods and how, how um, money getting out of control can lead to a distortion in that relative price. I think the new, um, in inverted commas, idea I'm trying to get across in this book is that asset price inflation in today's world is probably better thought of in terms of the irrational exuberance idea which has been pioneered so much by the behavioral finance theorists and, and particularly by um, Schiller. Um, but where I would take difference with the behavioral finance theorists is that they in no way admit the essential monetary origins of a phenomenon they describe. If you read through Robert Schiller's uh, book on irrational exuberance, he lists about 15 factors responsible for irrational exuberance, of which number 14 is the fact that there was a Greenspan put in the 1990s, but in, it's, it's a sort of, a, sort of a, a, a incidental factor. Mm -hmm. Whilst, in fact, I argue that it's actually abs, abs, it's, the, it's the first of all factors without which you wouldn't have anything else. Um, the, um, what, what, how can we define this irrational exuberance? I think there's several ways in which you can think of it. Probably the simplest is um, the idea that when, when investors are suffering from irrational exuberance, they're wearing rose-colored spectacles, or, or the, which in general filter out the risks and probably exaggerate in size the expected returns. Another way of thinking of irrational exuberance is that if you think of the future as being different scenarios with different probabilities, um, the investors suffering from irrational exuberance are slanting those probabilities towards the more favorable outcomes away from what objectively they should do if they were in a sober, rational mood. Um, and then you have the definition of Schiller, which is in terms of more general social conditions and, um, and um, the, the other aspects he writes about. Now, I mentioned Milton Friedman at the start of today's talk, and I, and I do, in fact, through, throughout what I have to say. And a question which frequently comes to me is, why did Milton Friedman not embrace the concept of asset price inflation? After all, he was in Chicago University. Hayek was walking the same roads as he was. He was undoubtedly aware of this concept of asset price inflation, and yet nowhere does it even get a mention in monetary history of the United States. And I think the, the reason for that is probably the, the concern which Milton Friedman had for so-called positive economics. You only discuss something if you can actually test its existence empirically. 
And of course, a great problem with asset price inflation is it's a very difficult um, phenomenon to actually test. You know, how, how do you actually assess whether investors are suffering from irrational exuberance and how much markets at any particular point are subject to this irrational exuberance? Um, and um, there's no simple metrics. You know, you may, reading Janet Yellen or some Fed officials, you may think it's a simple thing to test. You just look at the P-E ratio or whatever. But of course, that doesn't tell you anything. Um, because in some, at some times P-E ratios should be high, at other times they should be low relative to how much uncertainty there is out there and what the state of the world is and what the future looks like. So there's no general benchmark you can look at to tell you whether there's asset price inflation or not asset price inflation. Um, and what, but, I, but there is an, certainly an insight to be gained from Friedman in all of this, that in the same way that Friedman me makes over and over again the point that there's long lags between monetary disequilibrium and when goods and services inflation appears. It's also true that there's long lags between monetary disequilibrium and the point at which any central bank official or even gifted investment analyst can be sure that there's asset price inflation. So that by, by the time any the, the army of regulators or anyone else can realize that there's asset price inflation, um, the monetary disequilibrium has already been there long since. And, and history is, history is, um, is um, full of examples of where central bank officials belatedly realize that there's asset price inflation by the time they come to act. It only makes worse the subsequent asset price deflation. Because a key point about asset price inflation is asset price inflation burns itself out of its own accord. You know, either the rose-colored spectacles sp splinter because reality turns out so different, becomes more and more different from the, the, the vision they're seeing through the, the glasses, or it burns itself out because there's so much excess capacity and low profit rates from the dead-end act activities which the exa rational exuberance is producing that um, profits don't match up with expectations. Um, so, the, you know, you can think of examples in history. By the time the central bank's Federal Reserve starts tightening policy in 1928, the, the Florida bubble's already burst and the real estate market's already peaking. By the time the Bank of Japan raises interest rates in 1989, the bubble would have come to an end anyhow, so they only make matters worse. By the time Ben Bernanke in 2007 push, pushes up interest rates, the bubble was already going to be bursting anyhow, so you end up with um, the the aberration of um, interest rates at four or five percent in 2008 when the economy is already in recession. So, so you can quote over and over again this example of, 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 of central banks recognizing late asset price inflation and making it worse when the, the subsequent recession worse. Now, um, there's three main channels for where, where the monetary virus attack leads to asset price inflation. And um, the three links between monetary disequilibrium and the, the emergence of asset price inflation. The first and fundamental one is central banks, and I'm talking here principally of the Fed, through pegging short-term interest rates and also indicating that interest rates are going to be pursuing a given path in the future, um, very often end up inducing a level of long-term interest rates which are artificially low, below the so-called equilibrium or neutral level. Because if, if you, you know, in a pre-1914 gold standard world, short-term interest rates vary tremendously. Nobody, there was no pegging of short-term rates. So long-term interest rates basically reflected the market's best estimate of neutrality. It, it, was, it, it, it reflected a wealth of information about particular demands and particular supplies of capital. Once you move into an environment where the Fed is pegging rates and pretty well making clear or, or, or encouraging speculation as to where rates are going to be in the future, long-term rates lose, lose that informational content and, they, and very often they will, they will come to be a long low, way below the neutral, le neutral level. And, um, the, if it, and that fall of long-term rates below neutral encourages a lot of speculative froth. It, it, it creates a froth in capital markets. And if there are speculative hypotheses around which seem fairly credible and you get this froth, the froth or the price rise seems to justify the speculative hypothesis. So you get what Schiller describes, and this comes back to the behavioral finance, of positive feedback loops. We can all think of popular hypotheses that have, that have, have been the subject of this asset price inflation. You can go back to the uh, the the um, 
the last cycle of home ownership in the United States. Um, you can think of the 1990s of the, mir the perpetual miracles of the IT boom. Um, you, you, can, you can think of Spain as the Florida of Germany and Britain. All, all of these stories which have supported um, uh, speculative stories have sort of earned their justification for some time because the prices seem to be rising to justify the story. Um, and the prices were rising to justify the stories was because long-term interest rates were way, way below neutral. The other um, channels of monetary virus attack um, are when interest rates have been low for a long time, maybe in line with neutral, there's a sort of, um, there's a sort of, a sort of desperation sets in amongst investors to get a higher level of yield. And if they haven't had a period of so-called good deflation, which we would have under a period in, in a world of monetary stability where price, sometimes prices fall and sometimes prices rise. It's sort of like a one-way one, one -way street. They're, they're, they're in a perpetual state of, um, of um, concern about uh, real income famine on safe, on safe assets. And this, this encourages the, the sort of um, wearing of tinted glasses and looking at investments to get real return. And the third, ele the third element of, of, of monetary virus attack encouraging irrational exuberance is inflation scare. Even though there may be no prospect of inflation in year one or year two or year three, the, the, the possibility of high inflation in the future um, produces the, these, the sort of behavior um, I've been alluding to as, 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 as irrational. Now, um, maybe at this point I just come on to a quick example of some of what I've been talking about in terms of Fed history over the last 100 years. Um, the first point I would make is that asset price inflation, irrational exuberance, didn't originate with the Federal Reserve. But the size of the waves and their frequency has got much larger under that institution's 100-year monetary history. Um, under the gold standard, which preceded the Federal Reserve's um, coming into existence in 1913, 1914, um, you had one big wave of ir irrational exuberance in 1907. Um, that, that basically came about because of the very rapid growth in gold supplies mm. over the previous decade, which led to a lot of monetary base expansion, artificially low interest rates. So that was an example of where gold standard can, to some extent, go off rails and, and produce the same sort of phenomenon of, of irrational exuberance that you've got under the Fed system. But more generally, um, the, the um, gold standard did have certain checks and balances which prevented emergence of irrational exuberance. Um, you had this free, determin of in of free determination of interest rates. Um, all the countries which were on the gold standard effectively had a monetary base control system where the monetary base was determined by the gold price for the whole block. Um, price level moved up and down so that the, the, the price level could, um, you, you didn't need Ben Bernanke creating negative interest rates through artificially prompting, propping up inflation expectations under the gold standard. Price level fell during periods of recession. It was expected to rise again during periods of recovery. So during, during the period of weak economy, there was the expectation of price level recovery meant that real interest rates were effectively negative. So that was built into the system. You didn't need the artificial creations of Bernankeism. Um, but no sooner did the Fed open its doors in 1914 when the gold standard disintegrated with the eruption of World War I. Um, I have a chapter, in, not a chapter, but a few pages in the book about the history of the Federal Reserve during the First World War, First World War which is, um, in, in many ways, I think, um, uh, opens, opens one's eyes to what follows, because, in fact, from 1915 to 1917, you had a very powerful asset price inflation and goods and services inflation, which was due to the dumping of gold in the US by the Entente powers, which was basically monetized by the Fed, creating high mon monetary base expansion, artificially low interest rates, and that was the consequence. If we go fast forward to 1921 um, to 1929, I focus on this period particularly in the book because 
it, it comes on to the subject as to what went wrong with the first monetarist revolution, which was basically dominated by giants such as Milton Friedman and, and, and um, others uh, we, can th we can think of. Um, Friedman and Schwartz described the period 1921 to 1929 as the high tide of the Federal Reserve System. And yet if you read people like um, Rothbard or Mises or um, the, the other uh, similar accounts, this is actually the low point of the Federal Reserve, one of the low points of the Federal Reserve. And I think the distinction is that, again, Friedman was not concerned with the concept of asset price inflation, but focusing on the goods and services inflation. And of course, in the 1920s, you had stable price level, because this was a period of rapid productivity growth. Um, and the, the Austrian argument is that the price level should have been falling. Um, but what, in fact, the Fed under Benjamin Strong was doing was stabilizing the price level, keeping interest rates artificially low as a result, because they should have been high in real terms, reflecting the, the, uh, the revolution in technology. Um, and, of course, for the first time, because of the Fed system, the bond market became manipulated. One, if anyone looks at the data from the 1920s, what's striking is that during this period of rapid growth and stock market bubble, long-term bond yields were pretty well pegged for the whole time at about 3%. Um, and that was a reflection of these um, pegging operations in the money market. If you'd had a, if, if you'd had a system where monetary base was being um, controlled rigorously um, and interest rates were freely determined in the bond markets, you would have had bond yields which could have been several percentage points higher. Now the, the corollary of all of this was that investors, this was a very frothy period in asset markets, investors <coughs> were desperate uh, they saw, saw the froth as evidence of um, some of the speculative hypotheses around, and they also wanted higher yields. And what you have to recognize about the 1920s was that from 1924, the second largest economy in the world at that time was Germany, entered the dollar area, it effectively pegged its currency to the dollar in 1924. So, but Germany had come out of a period of war and hyperinflation, total destruction, and the equilibrium level of interest rates in Germany was presumably very high. Um, given that the rates were artificially low in the United States, there, was, there, there became a huge demand from U.S. to buy German, German bonds, German credits, German, German everything. And um, of course, the, the fact that rates were low in Germany, below that neutral level in Germany, meant that to some extent you got a lot of froth in Germany. Real estate prices in Berlin went up six times in four years, pretty well, between 1925 and 1929. So you had this gigantic credit bubble, asset bubble in Germany, basically being created as a f as a as a hang on, as a as a as a as a reflection of the U.S. monetary disequilibrium, and um, of course that was doomed to burst, which it did. Um, and um, when it burst, you know, today we have all discussion about Greece going bankrupt. It wasn't Greece going bankrupt in 1931. It was the second largest economy going bankrupt in the world going into autarky and over a political abyss. So if you, think, if you think of the effect of that in the world economy or in the United States, it had to be tremendous. And I think that's something which doesn't feature sufficiently in a lot of the historical accounts um, of, of that period. Now, just before coming on to the modern time, um, I, th I think there's one more example of, of interest for the Fed for today um, from the 1930s, and that is the often quoted example of the Fed um, derailing the recovery in 1936-1937 by pushing up reserve requirements too early. I, I tend to see that as a, as, a, as, a, as a myth because what you actually have from 1935 onwards is that the Fed was creating um, massive expansion of monetary base, not under QE, but as a result of gold inflows. And these low interest rates um, or, or, or zero rates together with the rise in price level encouraged a lot of speculation. So that by 1936, you had the equity market pretty well doubling from 1936 to 37, commodity markets going through the roof. And um, through the rose-colored spectacles, investors were losing sight of the fact that the world was moving towards war, that the European block, gold block was falling apart, that um, profits were just failing to rise in the US because of a whole lot of legislation introduced by um, labor legislation, etc. And um, there was bound to be a, a market correction to the asset price inflation was bound to burn out, 
which happened with a vengeance in 1937 with a 40% collapse of the equity market in, four, in, in, in about six months, bringing on the Roosevelt recession, which um, was as severe as the 1929-30 recession. So I think when you look at that period, that, that is another, that's an example of asset price inflation created by the Fed, um, even when the economy seems to be quite weak. And if Janet Yellen or the army of regulators had been around in 1936, they certainly wouldn't have diagnosed asset price inflation. Um, but there was asset price inflation nonetheless. Now, um, fast forward to the sort of present period. Um, a new, I'll just make one further comment about the 1960s, which is very, of, very often people talk of the Bretton Woods period as a golden period of monetary policy in the United mm -hmm. States. Again, I beg to differ here. I think what you had through the night from the period 1953 to 19, the late 60s or mid 60s was, was actually um, US had rapid productivity growth. The whole world had rapid productivity growth. This was, this was a boom period. And yet the Martin Fed at the time was essentially um, keeping interest rates fairly low. They were allowing inflation in the United States to run at about 2% per annum, when in fact, through a period of rap rapid productivity growth, price level, if anything, should it be stable, stable or falling. Um, the rest of the world was, um, had even faster productivity growth in the United States, so their price, and, and, and so for there to be any sort of stable price level internationally, the US actually would have had to have some fall in its price level. Um, instead of which, um, the Fed was um, persisting with running a policy which created inflation at 1% to 2%. And in fact, for his credit, Arthur Burns, who later got reviled from, in many respects, wrote a book at the end of the 1950s criticizing the Fed for running monetary policy in interest inflation at 1% rather than zero. Um, and the, the, the tragedy in many ways of that Martin, pe Martin period of, of low inflation um, was first of all, it created massive asset price inflation. If you look at the period 1962 to 67, stock markets pretty well trebled in five years. That was a period when Warren Buffett made his um, first billion, when you had titans when, of, of real estate growing. And, and of course, all of that ended up with a fantastic crash in 1969 to 73. So that was another, that, that was another huge example of asset price inflation in the United States generated by, by Fed policy. Um, the, new, the new element which came in in the 1970s was for, uh, and the end of the Bretton Woods system was that the Fed more and more changed into being a uh, um, currency war machine. Um, so that you, you saw the Fed deliberately at various stages um, keeping rates below where they should be and, and manipulating long-term interest rates essentially in pursuance of a currency war agenda. And, and, and again, an example I pick out of that in the book is um, where you come to Plaza in 1985, where essentially Paul Volcker um, signs up to a Plaza Accord to devalue the dollar um, and force other currencies to appreciate, although the other currencies weren't doing anything wrong. I mean, the yen and Deutsche Mark at the time were completely free market currencies with no exchange controls or no, no manipulation. But essentially, to get the currency down, the dollar down, and reduce the so-called U.S. current account deficit, the 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 um, Volcker Fed um, abandoned monetarism, kept interest rates artificially low, and of course, by 1987, you had the stock market bubble and crash, and beyond that, you had the real estate bubble all around the world, and of course, that percolated on to Japan with a fantastic um, bubble and crash in in the Japanese economy. Um, Maybe in a question and answer session, I can take more on where this all leads in terms of the history, although I would mention that under Bernanke, in the, um, in the, in the um, uh, last few years, the currency war machine aspect of the Fed has become more important than ever before. I mean, this is, this is the first Fed president on record who's actually defended openly currency war as, as, as a good thing, in the sense that um, if you look at his various um, comments, um, he's, he, he says that currency war essentially has a more powerful income effect than substitution effect, meaning that other countries gain more from the U.S. recovering than what they lose through the devaluation of the dollar. But um, to round up, how, what, what cure 
can we imagine for this curse of the Federal Reserve um, in terms of these waves of irrational exuberance on the world? And I, I have several recommendations in the book. First is that inflation targeting should be dropped altogether in favour of price level stability over the very long run. Second, um, deflation phobia has to be treated. Um, this idea that any deflation is bad has absolutely no theoretical basis or practical basis. Um, it, it's okay in a few Keynesian models where the world comes to an end tomorrow. Um, but um, price, as I, as I highlighted earlier in, in, in the lecture, price level declines um, and rebounds play a very Im did play a very important part in the in the self um, self equilibrating um, uh, of the uh, economy under the gold standard and would again under a regime of price level stability. Um, third, we have to stop all manipulation of long-term interest rates, and I think realistically to stop all manipulation of long-term interest rates, one again has to have a free, free um, floating short-term interest rate, because once central banks get into the act of fixing short-term rates, the markets just extrapolate those into the long term. So it's best to have a lot of white noise in the short-term money markets to allow the long-term interest rate markets to do their job properly. Um, fourthly, we have to re restore the monetary base to the pivot of the monetary system. Now, the, monet the monetary base has, has effectively been removed from the from pivot of the monetary system by two, by two two so-called reforms. First of all, lowering reserve requirements persistently means that monetary base loses significance because there's no longer any stable relationship between monetary base and the wider economy. Um, and secondly, monetary base has to pay no, no interest. Once money, monetary reserves pay interest at the market rate, you, you, you destroy all the self-regulating um, aspect of the, of the money market which existed under the gold standard or could exist under a monetary-based type system. Um, fifth, we have to eliminate Orwellian monetary history. And what I mean by Orwellian monetary history, you get, an you get an example of Orwellian monetary history if you look at Professor Bernanke's lectures to students last year on the history of the Federal Reserve. If you look through the reading list, not one mention of Rothbard, Mises, Hayek, or anyone else. It's just generally um, a, a Fed, Fed neutral book. Um, and um, also, the, you have to, to, to a large extent, as I argue in the book, for Bernankeism rests on, on mythology and two, two historical mythology, and the two, two important chapters in the historical mythology are the Great Depression, which I've already discussed, um, and secondly, Japan's Great Deflation. You know, so much of what the present Bernankeite um, monetary policy in the US now um, does is, is defended in terms of not, not repeating the mistakes in Japan, not suffering deflation in Japan. Now, the, 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 the odd as aspect of all of this is that there hasn't been any deflation in Japan. If you look, if you look at if you look at the price level today compared to where it was in 1990 in Japan, on the, on 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 some indices like consumer prices, it may be down about three or four percent. On other consumer price uh, cons consumption deflator, it may be down ten percent. But this is all taking account of so-called hedonistic accounting, which allows for um, um, if, if if there's quali quality improvements, that's treated as a price reduction. But if you go back to the gold standard world before 1914, nobody adjusted prices for that, and price, prices were stable. So that in today's terms, prices would have been falling all the time. So, so Japan, Japan, uh, uh, Japan, you could say, has actually come the nearest of any country to the ideal of price level stability. That hasn't been the problem. The problem in Japan comes much more to my f other aspect of um, what I was discussing, ways of economic destruction, that in Japan, there's a very sick equity risk appetite. Nobody is prepared to take equity risk except a very high return, uh, very high returns, because the whole system. First of all, you, you had the tremendous bubble burst in, in uh, mm -hmm. of the early 1990s. Secondly, the whole Japanese financial system has become more and more mobilised to providing artificially low-cost finance to the government sector, government pension funds having to put all their money into government debt, postal savings, subsidising people to buy government debt. The whole system has become a massive mobilisation machine towards funding government. Um, and um, by, by the, the conversely, equity risk-taking is, is implicitly penalised. Um, and that's a real problem with Japan. And um, not not the amongst not many others not not the so-called deflation which is a, which is an, which is which has been a, a, a non-problem. 
And finally, why am I even optimistic that there's going to be eventually a second monetarist revolution in the United States? Um, mm -hmm. On the positive side, we have to say there are political forces in the U.S. which are um, deeply, uh, deeply dissatisfied with the present monetary regime. Um, a, a big problem has been there's been no academic doctrine to rally around in, in, the, in the 1970s. Um, the first monetarist revolution essentially had the benefit of, uh, of a um, growingly recognized academic, academic doctrine to fit. Um, I think the, um, a key question in predicting whether there's going to be any monetary change is actually coming back to the question as to uh, is or is Bernankeism and the present Bernankeite monetary experiment going to end up with the 1937 moment? You know, if, if one imagines that so much asset price inflation has been created by the Fed and will continue to be, that it will all end up bursting at some stage and will be a equivalent of Roosevelt recession, that's clearly the moment which is most propitious for a monetary regime change. It's by no means assured because, you know, everything depends on the timing. If the asset price inflations are booming and the economy is booming in 2016, there's no, there's no swing in the political pendulum. Um, so like any revolution or, or Napoleon said about his generals, the most important quality was luck. Um, that's also true of, re of, re of revolutions. Um, and and um, what I would say is that this, uh, a, a key condition of this second monetarist revolution to succeed where the first revolution failed is to recognize this key importance of asset price inflation, which was not recognized in the first monetary revolution. Um, and um, I think also Benang uh, the second monetarist revolutionaries have to be honest about the mistakes of the first monetarist revolutions, that unfortunately um, Milton Friedman was drawn into Bernankeism in many ways to justify it. Um, and that, that, that has to be recognized and um, undone. And finally, I'll leave you with the thought, which is beyond today's lecture, but is in the book, that the Fed has to be closed down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, great, thank you very much. Um, if I could just get an idea of how many people want to ask questions. If you have a question in mind, if you could raise your hand, then um, so we have one, two, three. So I think we'll just go first with this question, and then I'll come to you at the back. Here, so go ahead. So I'm just going to your point about trying to distinguish um, asset <coughs> price inflation bubbles, and you say how difficult it is, and people say how difficult it is. I just wondered whether or not there was any link to the growth of broad money, or whether that was too distorted to identify it, because certainly if you look at the 2005 to 2007 period in UK, Ireland, whatever, you know, and look at the broad money uh, picture which was being ignored, you'd have had a, a heck of a good indicator of something very much up, and there was big asset price inflation then. So is that helpful in any um, way? Um, it's, it's certainly an indicator which um, you would look at, and um, the BIS in looking at various indicators of bubble and the particularly in uh, work with China, you know, the growth of credit or uh, broad money over a particular interval is, is one of the so-called indicators. But I would also caution that if you'd done that sort of work in the 1920s, you wouldn't have found anything. I mean, that's after all why Friedman called the 1920s the high tide of the Federal Reserve System. But the, the monetary disequilibrium at that time wasn't apparent from the broad money indicators, but it was apparent if you looked at monetary base in the sense that if you, do, like if you go carefully through the monetary base data, um, that was growing um, s somewhat fast, um, taking account of the Federal Reserve's system of reserve requirements and the shift of, of, of monetary base towards the city banks, which had lower reserve requirements, and time deposits had lower reserve requirements. So, um, but also the other aspect of the, of the monetary base <coughs> situation in the 1920s was that the Fed came in and um, um, created large swings in monetary base growth so as to stabilize short-term interest rates. So for example, in the early 20s, during a, during a business cycle um, reco recovery, they, they were actually pumping up the monetary base to some extent um, to, to, to quicken the recovery. 
1927 they came in and actually withdrew monetary base or slowed it down to influence the exchange rate with sterling so there was a lot of there was a lot of there, it was it wasn't a steady state growth but it, the the way in which it was actually um, uh, manipulated was to stabilize short term rates which had the very harmful impact of of um, leading to this manipulate manipulation of long term rates down which again allowed the bubble to go on so that's an example of where looking at broad money wouldn't have picked any of that up. Great, I'll take two questions at a time now. So, um, first question at the back there. Yeah. So, uh, thank you for your talk. Do, do you think it's possible, based on you know, agreeing with your understanding, to use that to, to formulate an investment strategy? Or do you think that because you, know, you still don't know when the asset bubbles are going to increase or decrease, that actually it's, it's not really very helpful for investors? Um, I mean, that's an absolute key point that you raise, and uh, in fact, my last chapter of the book is, is on the question of how investors should, should um, um, uh, try to um, use this information to, towards improving investment performance. Um, I think the first point is that if a lot of this manipulation is taking place and you do have these ways of irrational exuberance or asset price inflation, then clearly a lot of the ideas of the efficient market literature don't apply. You can't just sit passively and um, put so much of your wealth into different asset classes and go to sleep and assume that's the best you can do. Um, neither can you decide that um, you're not going to take any part in the dance um, and forgo all the returns during the asset price inflation stage. But you don't either, like for Citibank chairman, want to end up dancing when the dance comes to an end. So um, I think you, you, you have to, um, as an act active investor, take a view um, based on history and based on other factors you're looking at as to how far you think we are along in this wave of asset price inflation, how much longer you think it's got to go on, although for sure nobody, nobody knows, can give you the date. Um, and I think you also have to look for strategies which to some extent are negatively correlated. So like I argue in the book, that if you are taking a view a year ago or six months ago, that um, maybe, because one th point I didn't make is asset price inflation isn't general at all times. Certain asset classes, you know, asset price inflation, the, the virus infection goes for one asset class, then another asset class during, there may be several asset classes at, 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 at the peak period, but it tends to rotate. So, you know, the Bernankeite monetary experiment, first of all, produced its asset price inflation in emerging markets, commodities, commodity extraction companies. Um, um, but some of that is already picking or even going down or, or may go down whilst other asset price inflations in like in the US equity market may still be gathering pace. So if as an investor, you can to some extent be gambling on which asset price inflations are ending and take short positions in these as long as, as well as long positions in asset price inflations, but you still have further to go. To some extent, you've got some negative correlation there, which reduces your overall risk. So for example, if you're short at the moment, Canadian dollars or Australian dollars or euros at the same time as your long US equities or Japan, to some extent that, that's, that reduces your overall risk in making your judgment. Okay, and um, first you, and then uh, you, and then if you take them both together. Then yeah. yeah, great. You alluded to, to, to the, um, the large constituency which is opposed to, well, there's this sort of Keynesian Friedmanite monetarist output gap. Economics is very, very dominant, uh, both in the universities and in the city and in um, the newspapers. Mm. It strikes me one of the problems to get from uh, from the world we're in to the world we'd like to be in is that a map needs to be laid out of how you get from where we are now to where we'd like to be, how you actually in concrete terms restructure the balance sheets of banks and the balance sheets of central banks without <coughs> leading to this, the deflation to which you also alluded which is the unthinkable thing that must never be allowed to happen. Uh, and <coughs> do you feel enough work has been done to get us from where we are now, or lay out a, a concrete, achievable map from where we are now to where we'd like to be. Okay, and um, yes, it's very closely related. You, almost as a sort of final afterthought, you've flung in the idea of closing down the Fed. In your book, do you write at slightly greater length about that? What it actually means, what the process consists of? 
Um, if the answer is simply yes, I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try to. I mean, on the on the output gap. Um, Actually, I, I, I do come to quite a lot, and that's related to so-called Taylor rule, which has sort of become part of central bank orthodoxy and Bernankeism, that you can use this Taylor rule, which depends on knowing what the output gap is and what the neutral real interest rate is to, to signal the interest rate. But, of course, in terms of the ideas I'm putting forward and other, other people have put forward, um, we don't know what the output gap is, because um, who, you are nobody else knows how much economic destruction there was during the previous bubble, how much redundancy, how, how, much, how much shortage of capital there may be. That's something the market has to discover. And that's why it's best leaving interest rates freely to market determination, especially long-term rates, to get the best judgment as to what these are, rather than mm. central bank officials enforcing some view as to where they mm. think these, these gaps are. Um, but they look um, at job vacancies and things, don't they, as a measure of output, or the output shortage, or the output. But we, we don't know. Um, we uh, we I don't agree with you. It's nonsense. But they can that's, that's what they do. But, but the, the Taylor rule sometimes is quoted as an, as an example of a monetary rule. But of course, it's no such thing. It's it's a highly discretionary um, piece of piece piece of machi monetary machinery. Um, now, in, in terms of how we get from here to there. Uh, um, from a present system to a market-based system, that is a real, that is a real, a real question because, like everything else in economic life, there's a learning process and a relearning process. You know, if you go back to the gold standard world, businesses realised that in times of recession, prices were cut. Um, w workers in highly cyclical in industries realised that wages went down in recession and up in. But to 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 get all this behaviour again um, as sort of reflex takes time, may, may, maybe maybe two or three cycles. So so um, so what can what can the second monetarist revolutionaries offer to make it worthwhile going through that learning process? Well, I, I would argue that in the, in a situation of the next recession and next crash, there will certainly be a yearning for something better than what we've been through. Secondly, the monetary stability, if, it's, if, it's, um, if, if it can be introduced, should actually be very positive for equity markets. I mean, when you measure equity markets, yes, Bernankeism pumps them up, but it pumps them up from a level which is low because of so much monetary uncertainty. Um, if you remove that monetary uncertainty, it may be that over a five-year period, equity markets are higher than anything Bernanke could have pumped them up to. Um, and um, so, so, and, uh, so, so, the, so I, I, I would put that as the sort of off, offsetting benefit. Um, as far as the Fe Federal Reserve um, abolishing goes, you know, it's it's a real issue here as to, and I and I know Robert Pringle, who we work together a lot on the on the third chapter of a book which is to do with the next monetarist revolution, we sort of discussed a lot between ourselves, is, the benefit, is it really realistic to have a monetary based system um, even without the Fed, um, which doesn't get corrupted politically and is the only real alternative gold standard, even although we know that from history um, gold standard did have some periods of asset price inflation in like 1907. And even though we know that um, there's, there's all the problems of fixed exchange rates and everything else, I, th I sort of came down more on side of yes, it's possible, but you to have a monetary-based system, um, but without the Fed, which means that you would have to have something like a U.S. monetary institute, which, under strict constitutional rules, was only allowed to vary um, rate of monetary-based growth according to certain criteria, and, and, and as much as possible. These were fenced in constitutionally, so it wasn't a matter of simple majorities in a in a parliament or a, or a congress. Um, this was uh, this was and, and that you would do away with the whole maestro concept of of Bernanke or Greenspan or anyone else by just having one year one year terms or two year terms. If you think of a Bank of England before 1914, the governor never operated for more than was there for two years and then it was somebody else. You know, you you have to get as much as possible away from these these. Um, discretionary um, policy makers. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I, do, uh, I do go into that in, in the book, although I must say even now I don't have, uh, you can't have 100% confidence in, in, in whether that will be corrupted or not. Well, I'm not so much concerned with whether it's a good idea as to what exactly the process consists of. So the process will yes. consist of having a high reserve requirement on um, all um, 
bank liabilities, um, no interest paid, um, and a fixed rate of expansion of that monetary base, which could only be varied according to certain strict um, conditions. Because after all, in the gold standard world, you did have monetary base varied under certain sit situations of um, persistent deflation, which would lead to greater gold production or um, other, it other similar. like a kind of modified, cleaned up version of central banking. Um, that, may, that may be an ignorant and stupid remark. That's what it sounded like to me. Well, there's no discretion here. There's, yeah. a, there's a basically monetary base is, yeah. um, is, is produced um, by this monetary institute according to a strict constitutional rule. So you don't get people sitting around the table deciding where interest rates are to be or what's going to happen to the economy or what the, what the best projection of the business cycle is. None of that comes into it at all. Okay, I'm going to take the last three questions in one go. So first you, then you, then you. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to concentrate, if, if, if that's okay, on the more generic aspect of the, of the hypothesis. I have heard uh, different uh, uh, neoclassical liberal economists claiming that the Fed is the main responsible for the crisis, the most recent one and all the crisis. But I wonder if uh, some elements of irrationality uh, from investors and entrepreneurs uh, uh, played a significant role as well. And along with that, perhaps a degree of corruption which was enough to cause uh, uh, the crisis we are seeing. And let me make a, a, a historical reference to this. Uh, Bernard, uh, uh, Alfred, uh, Frederick Hayek uh, praised Bernard Mandeville significant mm. for his work. And Bernard Mandeville, which by the way was hated by Adam Smith, said, we all, we all are self-interested people, but we are knaves as well. No sympathy, self-interest only, but we are knaves. And of course, Adam Smith rejected that, that idea, David Hume and others did. And I wonder if, for instance, in, in public choice theory, uh, uh, James Buchanan and Tulloch have embraced that uh, <coughs> hypothesis about neighbory plus self-interest in political science. And I wonder if, uh, perhaps in economics, we should consider irrationality and corruption because if that's the case, even if the Fed is dissolved, it might be not a real solution to the problem. My question is about deflation. Deflation has a bad press because it is deemed to be unstoppable once it sets in. Is there anybody, this is the question, is there anybody who has sought to refute the view that deflation would never stop of its own accord. Great. And the last question. Yeah. Two, I mean... Uh, no, pick the best one. <laughs> well, best question, the yeah. The assumption that we're all playing the same game, it seems to me that the owners of the private Fed and the parties that they represent have done very well out of this and continue to do very well out of this. And just my second one is, do you regard gold as just another asset class amongst asset classes of which they can be exuberant? Um, what's exuberant? Okay. Um, to come back to the, I mean, yes, clearly in any real world, there's um, uh, corruption and knavery, etc., etc. But I would make the point that, um, to a considerable degree, freely functioning markets under monetary stability disciplines that. So that um, if you go back to what. I would call knavery a, um, I'm sorry to mention names, but the purchase of uh, ABN AMRO at the peak by British banks and, um, and the shareholders all going along with that and the institutions voting in favor of it, even although we were already into the credit run, into the bubble bursting process. If, if in, a, in, a, in a monetary stability system, the, you wouldn't have had the bubble in equity financial equities which allowed that to take place. The mm -hmm. financial equities market would have been disciplining mm -hmm. much better what these financial institutions were doing. But in an environment where everything seems to be going up, they lose that disciplinary function. Um, in terms of deflation, I mean, yes, in the, in the, in the, in the pre-1914 world, um, you had periods of deflation, periods of inflation. Nobody, nobody was concerned about deflation because everyone realized that it was temporary and that in the long term prices were stable. So if they were coming down now, they were going up in the future. And that was, in fact, how the system got back to equilibrium by creating temporarily periods of negative real interest rates. So, um, and you even had that in the 1920s, if you go and look at the 1921-22 recession. That's effectively how the U.S. pulled itself up. And of course, along, alongside that mechanism, the equity market played a key role, because mm -hmm. the equity market rose 
rose in anticipation, and and that fueled the 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 um, upturn in um, uh, 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 the upturn in, in invest in investment spending. So so so, so that would s certainly uh, I think. But again, one one. Um, has to get that message across. Yes, but that was the question. Is there an economist who is arguing deflation does not go on forever? Um, de definitely. I mean, the uh, I mean, the, 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 there, there is there is the the sort of Bernanke Bernanke I, um, uh, concern that de once deflation sets in, um, you get um, extrapolative expectations of deflation. Um, but um, and and to some extent, you you've seen that occasionally because of uh, the historical events. You know, in 1933 or 1930, you know, by the time you got the double whammy in 1931 of Germany defaulting, what normally would have been a rebound in 1931-32 became developed into a second recession with even more deflation. Um, and then there's a problem of, of the statistics that um, you know and, and learning that um, just because prices have been going down for some time doesn't mean they will continue to go down. It may be that there's just been a sequences of, of negative shocks, but you would expect them to go up in the future. But I mean, as to who's making these points, I, I guess certainly Austrian school, <laughs> Austrian school economists are making that point, and, it, and it's one which is well, um, well, 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 well accepted. Um, and sorry, I, I have to apologize if you just remind me of two, two questions again. Do private owners and FinTech yeah, not yeah. very well out of it? And secondly, gold as an asset class. Yeah. I mean, in terms of private owner, I mean, yes. I mean, Benanke, you have the, and I think this is what you mean, that Wall Street does very well out of Benankiism so long as you're in the upwave of the asset price inflation. Clearly, they don't do well when you come to the asset price deflation. But, um, but for, for the, during the asset price inflation, you have a very close um, um, interest between Benanke and, and Wall Street. Um, as, as regards gold, yes, I do think gold is a, is a very distinct asset from other commodities. But it's got qualities that um, allow it to be money, um, which other commodities it, it don't have. Um, and um, that's why it will always be distinct as, a, as, as, a, as that asset. Well, great. Thank you very much. Um, the book is on sale tonight for £15, The Global Curse of the Federal Reserve. Don't take my word for it. It's been reviewed extremely positively. Everywhere, every review I could find gave it a stunningly good review. So um, it's well worth a read, well worth uh, a pick up, and better to get it tonight than to get it for £60 tomorrow on Amazon and uh, regret. Maybe buy three copies, you know, one for each of your family or something like that. But, um, Brendan, thank you so much. You've been an excellent speaker. Um, the small gift we can give you, this is Inflation Proof, an Adam Smith tie, and um, we hope that you'll wear it and remember us, and um, come back and speak to us again soon. Thank, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.